Thank you for joining this session. We'll be talking about um, coding in general, and we'll be diving a bit deeper into HTML and CSS specifically. There is a lot of material to cover uh, given the time frame, so, um, so I will give uh, an amount of time for questions towards the end, and, um, and yeah, let's get started. All right, um, so this training is being provided by myself. Um, who I, I founded a Debug Academy. Um, so this is taken out of Debug Academy's three-month Drupal development course. Um, if you as an individual are looking for training, please get in touch. Um, we also provide training for um, companies and institutions. Um, and our preference is hands-on training in general. So this is normally a hands-on course. You will see a slide which says to download some files. Um, given the time frame, we won't have time to do it, but I left that slide in there in case you'd like to go watch the video afterwards and potentially um, get some hands-on experience. Uh, my name is Ashraf. Um, I worked as a technical architect at Acquia, the company whose CTO founded Drupal. Um, I worked there for about three years before uh, leaving to run Debug Academy full time. Um, I, have, I have all of the Drupal certifications, all that good stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's very important to understand the fundamentals of, um, of what you're building and the final output as well. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So the page we'll be building. Uh, one moment. This is the web page that we will make some progress um, building. Um, it's it's a concept site called Continuous Good. Um, I call it Continuous Good because it's the design that keeps on giving. I get to use it at all my free trainings. Um, but you are welcome to download all of the files for this design um, so that you can just get some experience putting the site together. Again, these uh, slides, you can watch them in the video, but we also attached um, the PowerPoint slides already on the Drupal Camp New Jersey website to this session. So if you go to this session's page, you can find all of these slides. Okay, so what does it mean to code something? Um, if you haven't coded before and you start to get into coding, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. And the, the reason is um, programming languages, they are like natural languages. You are communicating something. Um, but the difference is that programming languages have very limited, strictly defined vocabularies. Um, natural languages, on the other hand, they just happen, right? We want to communicate something. We, you know, we find a way to, um, to communicate them. Um, and even if let's say two of us don't speak the exact same language, we might be able to uh, figure out what the other is trying to communicate. Um, and languages evolve over time, natural languages evolve over time. Um, we take that stuff for granted, as well as body language and that sort of thing. We take all of that for granted. Um, programming languages, on the other hand, they're very explicit. There's no implication. Everything is, is um, stated, not implied. Um, and there's no body language. There's no reading between the lines. So as a programmer, you're taking in business requirements or some goal, and you are outputting um, a clear explanation or a translation of those requirements um, in code. So in this very limited language where nothing is implied. Um, so if you are coding, you are really translating from a human-friendly language to a specific programming language. Now, some people wonder, are we doing what Google Translate does? And not really. Programming is very hard to automate. It's very hard to fully automate, especially because, again, people can infer and read between the lines, whereas programming languages cannot. So something like Google Translate, 
it doesn't really have the ability to infer intention. Um, so that's where a good programmer, uh, or that, that's what can make a programmer very good. It's not necessarily that they understand the language, which of course is very important, but it's also the ability to understand the business requirements and convert that or transform that into a programming language, communicate that with a programming language. Um, so computers read only the lines, um, nothing between the lines. So I like to summarize that as programmers comprehensively translate tasks using a limited vocabulary in a language that is unnatural to humans. <laughs> And that's why many people feel that programming is challenging. There are many programming languages out there. Um, I'll talk about a couple of them because I'd like you to start thinking about the programming languages not as a monolith, not as I'm writing code, but I'm writing HTML. What can HTML do? I'm writing this other language. What can this language do? So every language has a vocabulary. In HTML, the vocabulary consists of the elements on the page. So in HTML, there's a form. Th there's a word for a form. There's a word for a table. There's a word for um, a division. Um, so that's the vocabulary or the language of HTML. Another important part of uh, language is who can understand the language and who can speak it. So for HTML, Web browsers are the ones who understand it. So Google Chrome, Firefox, those are the ones who can understand HTML. Um, and what I mean by that, why that matters is, if I'm speaking English, I might talk to one person and say something, and they understand the message one way. And I might talk to a different person with different experiences, different background, and they might take the exact same thing I say differently. Um, so it's important to know that the code you write, it also kind of has those limitations. You are writing code for something, for someone or something, and you have to keep in mind how does that software interpret this language. So the fact that HTML is understood by browsers means you have to keep in mind, when I write my HTML, what was Google Chrome's impression of it? What was Firefox's impression of it? What was Internet Explorer's, or I should say, understanding of it? Um, so for, and that's why that matters. So for HTML, I know these are the ones who are interpreting it. I need to test it on all of them. And that's why you get into cross-browser compatibility issues because of who is understanding the HTML. It's the browsers. CSS is similar in that the browsers are also the ones you're talking to. Um, so Chrome might interpret your CSS one way. Firefox might interpret it differently. and. I'm not talking theoretically. They do interpret certain HTML and certain CSS slightly differently. Um, so again, you have tools out there for testing your code on different browsers, and that's why. Um, CSS is understood by web browsers, but CSS, the language, also understands web browser users. So for example, if I'm on a website and I move my mouse over a link, you might see that an underline appears. That's because CSS, the language, understands when I put my mouse over the link. CSS receives information from the web browser user or from the web browser. HTML does not. So again, when you're writing a programming language, you have to think, what are the inputs? What are the outputs? There are more, uh, more involved languages than HTML and CSS, of course. JavaScript is one of them, and JavaScript has a bigger feature set. A lot of this applies to PHP as well. Um, JavaScript's vocabulary is much more expansive. Um, I don't know if I mentioned CSS's vocabulary. CSS's vocabulary consists of styling, so colors, spacing, positioning. JavaScript's vocabulary is much more expansive. Um, it, it can store information, modify data, uh, pass data around. It can send information to the browser, but it can also receive information from the browser. Um, it can it can uh, perform dynamic actions like it, it can un understand more. So if you scroll your window, it can make something appear. Like JavaScript has much more to its vocabulary, as well as much more to 
um, its ability to understand interactions from web browsers. So again, the reason for getting in this depth is if a client asks you to accomplish something, the answer is not necessarily, you know, what's the code for it? It might be, does this language even support this? You know, I'm using, you're, you're asking me to perform some interaction. Generally speaking, you want to start with HTML, CSS. Is this something that can be done in HTML and CSS? If so, that's where you should do it. Can it be done in JavaScript? Maybe you want to do it there. If not, maybe you need more information, pulling information from the database, that sort of thing. Um, JavaScript typically does not have direct access to the database. So at that point, when they're saying, give me information from the database, you might even be saying, I can't do this with JavaScript. Um, I need something for JavaScript to talk to. So I find it easiest to get your feet wet with uh, programming language um, by essentially removing all assumptions and preconceptions about the languages we've already heard of. So I like to explain it with an in real life programming language, IRL. Um, it has a very limited vocabulary, load person, which gives you control of a person, rotate joint, you can tell them to rotate any one of their joints, um, you can make them say a word, you can find where they are, and you can store data. This language is understood by humans using mind control, so you can uh, take control of any person and send them instructions. Um, it understands essentially social media interactions. So if you want the language to do something, you have to do it through a social media interaction. So now we get to the part where the client asks you to do something. The client says, okay, you know, I just, let's start small. I want someone to sit down, All right? Let, or you're learning the language. You just want to practice. You know, I want someone to sit down. So we get started. We, we look at that very limited vocabulary this language has. Part one is I want a person to sit down. So I need to pass instructions to a person. This language does have the ability to pass instructions to a person. And if I want to tell them which person to sit down, the only, the only way I'm able to communicate with the language is through social media interactions. So I would have to, maybe outside of the language, tell a person, follow the account on social media. So they do that. I've accomplished that part. So now I have a person. And now I can use the other functions. I can say, OK, I want you to sit down. I think that consists of rotating the joints or you're bending your left knee 90 degrees slowly, right knee, the same thing, your uh, hip 90 degrees in the other direction. and. I think, so that, that's my, my guess of, you know, how can I make a person sit down using this programming language. Um, so I'll, you know, try to run this code. At this point, I'm running it on myself. I bend my left knee 90 degrees. I bend my right knee 90 degrees. <laughs> and ugh, before I get to bend my hip in the other direction, I fall. Um, there's, there's a problem with our code. So this is why nothing is, this is an example of nothing being implied in programming. Even though it's obvious to a person, left knee, right knee, hip, that'll make you sit down, a person will say yes and they'll do it. The programming language will fit. So now you do some research, you find how do I make stuff happen at the same time in this language? And maybe you learn that if you don't keep calling the person repeatedly, then the language calls all these commands at the same time. So left knee, right knee, hip, in the other direction, all at the same time, run the code. And as long as there's a chair under me, I would be sitting on a chair. But now you can say the code works on my machine. Um, also, that, that phrase, it works on my machine, that's a common thing that programmers say. It's almost like a running comic, a running joke. Um, and that's partly because these languages, you have to think about who's listening to them. Maybe somebody tested it on Firefox and someone else tested it on Chrome, um, or even a different version of Firefox or Chrome. All right, so that's, that's a good little exercise. What if it were a little more complicated and you say, everyone in the room stand up? And to be clear, I don't expect you all to stand up. <laughs> um, 
So how would you get someone to do that? Or <coughs> write code using this language to do that? Um, first of all, the language doesn't know who everyone is. It only uh, understands social media interactions. So you would have to maybe as a you would have to basically make everyone do some social media interaction just to get them get the language to um, be able to interact with them. So because nothing's implied in programming, how do we make that happen? Let's look at the language. And at this point, you might need to think out of the box a little. So it's funny because you're not able to think totally out of the box. You have to think in the confines of the language. And then from there, you might need to, to be a little clever. And that's what a lot of programming is. People who really thoroughly understand the confines of the language and um, understand the business requirements from the client uh, or the goal of the task, they're able to put those two together and maybe come up with a clever way to work within the language to accomplish the goal. Or they might say, this part's just not possible. You know, let's, uh, let's use a different language or let's um, do some work around. So in this language, the client might say, make everyone stand up, um, that's the goal. You might say, well, within the confines of the language, there is no everyone. We need to get the teacher who's on our side. We need to tell the teacher to do a social media interaction um, beforehand. And then we can make the teacher say, follow some account on Twitter. And that can trigger others if, through their own free will to also perform a social media interaction. If they do it, then the code will be able to um, continue executing. So the language is very limited. In practice, if you do this, probably nobody would actually <laughs> do the social media interaction. Maybe some would. But this might be the best you can do with the language. So you get the teacher to follow the account on Twitter. And that makes the teacher say that statement. And then um, whoever in the audience also performs a social media interaction will then have this code executed. So then it'll trigger someone in the room to essentially stand up. So the left knee, right, it's the same code as before, but in the other direction. So theoretically, that, that works. That may be the best we can do from in that language. But then, depending on how the language works, if you want multiple people to stand up, you might need to write the code again and again. Right? You might need to say, next attendee, you know, load person, stand up, load person, stand up. And, uh, you know, that, that works. That's functional. Slow and steady wins the race. You know, we're chipping away. Um, we're writing our code. However, slow and steady might not always be a great approach because if you have a team of developers and you're doing this copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, and somebody else with a different approach comes in to the picture and they try to work in your code base, you know, it's just, it's an unavoidable collision. <laughs> um, especially if the task is even more complicated. And I'm not going to go through, you know, a task of make a person uh, go to a location. But at that point, you'd be racking your brains trying to think, how can I use this language? And maybe you can do something. Maybe you can have a person perform a social media interaction, you locate the person, you locate the destination, Chipotle in this example, you check the distance, and then we write code for taking a step with the rotate joint function. You know, bend your knee a little, bend your ankles, etc. cetera. Um, and you keep doing that until the distance is zero. It's a flawed approach, but we're not even done, and this is getting pretty complicated. So like, <laughs> this language is not a good fit for this test. There are some rules that apply across different programming languages. Um, these I didn't come up with these acronyms, but um, these are a couple of rules you can, you can live by in programming. Um, there's the KISS, keep it simple, stupid. A lot of people like to be clever in programming. They like to use like 
uh, write code that maybe only they understand, and at the end of the day, um, that's that ends up biting you in the future. Maybe some other programmer comes on the project, they don't understand what you wrote, or you don't look at the project for six months, you come back and you try to figure out what you wrote. Um, another principle is the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. Um, if you keep copying and pasting code and then you learn that you know maybe that code isn't very good or you need to add some functionality to it, um, you would have to modify it everywhere you've copied and pasted it. So in in programming languages, you can typically encapsulate your code in a function, and then you could reuse that function throughout the code base. Um, in practice, don't repeat yourself. I would say you're allowed to repeat yourself maybe twice. If you're repeating yourself three times, at that point, you should um, look into creating a function and enca encapsulating the, the code. Single responsibility, um, ensuring every function only does one thing and does it well. Um, that the bigger the project is, the more you benefit from doing that um, because you're able to test individual functions. So if something's not working on your site, you can test each function which only has one responsibility and see is this function behaving how I expect it to. And if it is, then you can move on and look at other parts of your system. Whereas if you have a single function doing 10 things, you can't really test those 10 things individually because they're all part of the same function. Um, let's see, separation of concerns. Um, it's the idea that code that's unrelated shouldn't be written together. Um, again, it makes maintaining code easier. There's also the Yagni principle. You aren't going to need it or you ain't going to need it. Um, a lot of times people will be writing code and they'll think, oh, I bet we'll do this other piece of functionality in the future. Let me write this function which will make that easier. And what ends up happening in practice is best case scenario, you write a function, in the future you use the function. Right? That's the absolute most optimal solution. Um, that doesn't really save you time over in the future just writing the function when you're going to use it. Um, but all the other possibilities that exist are you write the function and you forget that you wrote it because it's not being used anywhere, so you've just wasted that time. Um, or you write the function and then you never get to use it. Or even you write the function and it opens up a security hole. It's better to have less code than more code, um, especially if it's not being used. So don't try to write code that's not going to be used right away. Um, or going to be integrated with the system right away. Um, another one is to make it work and then make it good. So with that code we were writing where we were copying and pasting the whole stand-up code, that's fine. That's fine while you're writing it. You get the code to work. Once it's working, save your work, save that version of it, and then go back and do the deduplication. Um, so you don't need to, especially if you're really anyone, but especially if you're early on in your programming career, or coding career, um, don't stress so much about the perfect architecture. Try to validate that you can do it and then move on to um, structuring it properly. And finally, easy to understand naming. Um, there's a, there, there are variations of this, but there's a common saying, um, there are only two hard things in programming caching, naming things, and off by one errors. Um, the naming things is the one that tends to surprise people in that, in that statement. But you'll see the bigger applications you write, um, the more challenging naming things become. Um, I'll find that when I'm, when I'm writing some complicated code, I have like a, a Slack channel, a chat room with, uh, with four close friends, and I'll, always, uh, I'll regularly come to them and I'll say, um, I'm building this thing, I'm thinking about calling it this, but my concerns with that name are X, Y, Z, and we'll kind of debate, like, what's the best name for it, and then I'll go on and write the code. Um, recently I was writing, like, a, a way to duplicate um, tasks in my system, and I was like, okay, should I call it, like, task template? Should I call it, um, 
you know, assignment, which task is a subtype of assignment? Should I just call it template? You know, so that in the future, if I ever decide to clone things other than tasks, I can use it. So those are the kind of things that um, often more senior programmers will struggle with, is just how do I name this so that six months down the line, um, I'm not regretting the name that I picked. And even, it, it's not only about those like uh, edge case scenarios, it's also things like in CSS and HTML and CSS, you can choose a class name um, to reference for styling. And it's important not to choose um, a name because it's short. I teach, I teach a lot of people programming. I teach these, I teach part-time three-month class. And there's a, there's a lot of people who maybe have never programmed before. And um, before I explicitly said this, people would name their CSS classes things like A, B, and C, just because they're not thinking about, you know, two weeks from now when I want to reuse this class, which one am I picking? So you want to choose clear names, like, and, and um, on the CSS side, what, the naming is co can be complicated because if you choose a name like um, 12 pixel font, and then a month from now your client says, oh, there's a issue with accessibility, can we make it 14 pixel font by default, then you're going to go to that thing you called 12 pixel font and it's and you're going to increase the font size. So now everything called 12 pixel font is actually 14 pixels. So you would want to choose a better name up front, a name like medium font or something like that. Medium, small, smaller. So you, so you want to put some thought into your naming. So all of that is just programming in general without focus on a specific language. And now let's talk a little bit about HTML. So HTML is a language where you basically provide instructions to the browser saying what should appear on the page. Um, even sites that are built with the fancy buzzwords you might have heard about, you know, React, I mean, Drupal, whatever it might be, GraphQL, um, even those sites, at the end of the day, most of them are output using HTML. Um, even if they're built with React or whatever it may be, um, and the developers don't see the HTML, at the end of the day, on the web page, it's typically HTML. Um, relative to other programming languages, HTML is considered a simpler programming language, and that's largely because it's sort of one-to-one -one with what you write and what appears on the page. So if you want a table, you write the code for a table, and a table appears. It's all one-to-one. -one. Um, and HTML should not be used for styling. But it's a, it's a markup language. The idea, the idea is, or what that means is really, HTML is used to communicate to the browser not only data, but also give the, the browser a little bit of information about what the data is. Like, is this tabular data? Is this a heading? Etc. So here's an example of just content, right? We have a paragraph written out, um, nothing fancy about it, but we're going to go to this paragraph and we're going to mark it up. We're going to provide more information about it. So in HTML, we want to tell the browser this information. Um, we want to say, a tale of new cities, that's the content heading. Book, book the first, etc. that's the section heading, this is the start of the chapter, and this is the main body. So we'd say that we pass that information to the browser by using what are called HTML tags. And this is what it ends up looking like. So if we if we tell the browser this is the heading, this is the subheading, etc., and then we save the page and refresh, this is what it out, this is what it looks like. Um, again, HTML is not used for styling. It's very easy to um, to get tempted to do that and to say, you know, a primary heading is very big. I want this text to be very big. Therefore, I'll use a primary heading. Um, but it's important not to do that because because 
there there is meaning behind saying that it's a heading. There's meaning behind uh, beyond saying that it's big. Um, specifically, first first of all, the different browsers will interpret heading one differently in terms of the styling. Chrome might say, oh, heading one should be this big, whereas Firefox might make it a little larger than that. Um, so that would be in so, so um, you'll get different font sizes out of the box when you pick a tag. But more importantly is for accessibility. So for people who are visually impaired and they're visiting your website with maybe a screen reader tool, um, to navigate your site, they will use things like the headings as anchors. So they might read a heading and then decide, do I want to read the content below this heading or do I want to skip to the next heading? And if you make a word big by using a heading just to make it big, you're going to basically screw up their navigation. Um, also, search engines rely on the, the markup being semantically correct. So if you have your headings in the right place, you know, menu items are tagged as navigation, etc., then when your site appears on Google and whatever other search, um, you are empowering Google to extract information from your web page and maybe show it as a preview. Because um, you'll see when you search on certain pages, you sometimes see that it doesn't only show you the name of the page and a paragraph, it sometimes actually brings even more. Like it, it'll show you like, this is other, these are other pages on the site you can visit. This is other information you can access. And that's enabled by semantically correct HTML. It's not the website owner uh, submitting themselves to Google. Um, here's an example. Let's see if this will come up. So if I just search Debug Academy, I don't only get the home page, I get this indented look at the menu links. So just, I've never done anything with Google directly. I just built the site. Um, or actually students built the site. But Google had the information it needed to crawl and um, lay it out in that way. And one more thing that, it's not very, it, it hasn't happened much yet, but I expect that it will. Um, tools like Alexa, like the voice apps, um, I expect soon enough they'll get better at navigating web pages. And the websites that are created with proper HTML or that are semantically correct will be, the, they'll, um, the navigation on tools like Alexa will, will use the same navigation that screen readers use. Um, and, you know, if your site is semantically correct, you can say, hey, Alexa, go to debugacademy.com. Okay, no, next heading, next heading, you know, next section, that sort of thing. And you should be able to navigate a web page that way. Um, so set yourself up for the future by uh, making sure your content is accessible and semantically correct. Well, looking at HTML, the language, this is how it's written. You typically have a starting tag and an ending tag, or an opening and closing tag. Um, and it looks like this with the greater than and less than signs. Um, and in between the two tags, you have the content itself. So at the bottom, you see an example of a real HTML paragraph. You have an opening P tag, P for paragraph, a closing P tag, and in between you have the content. So by writing this out, you are telling search engines and screen readers, this is a paragraph on the page. In HTML, sometimes it's not enough to just provide content. So for a paragraph, it typically is enough to provide content, right? When you get a paragraph, all you expect to see is the words or are the words in the paragraph. Um, a link, on the other hand, you might expect to see the text, so the clickable text, and then, of course, the actual URL. So that's two pieces of information. With a start tag and an end tag, and then content in the middle, you're only given one place, to one piece of information that you can provide. So to provide additional pieces of information, like the link, you can pass attributes. So we have the href attribute, a href equals some URL, and then the content. 
So in this link, the, the A stands for anchor, and that's what you use to create links. Um, we're passing two pieces of information, the content, which is just the link, and the actual, or which is just the text for the link, and then the actual URL. Um, for an image, you have the ability to specify the image URL. Um, you could specify the width and the height in HTML as well. Um, images are one of the, the few tags where you don't typically put a start and end tag. For when you're building a web page, the first thing you'll need to provide the page with is um, basically, or provide the browser with, I should say, because that's who you're talking to, um, is what is the type of this page? So you can put a doc type tag at the beginning, which tells the browser this is an HTML page. Beyond that, you can provide more metadata. Um, so you could provide the page title and um, information about like what language the content is in, um, you can pass that all in through the HTML as well. All right, so let's look at what happens when certain HTML tags are written. So over here, you see what happens when we add the title tag. Um, title is shown in red, and by adding the title tag, the browser gets updated. So the top uh, navigation bar on your browser gets populated with whatever you wrote in the title tag. Um, there are certain, there are exercises in here. I'm going to skip the exercises and if we have time I'll show you this within the context of our design. Um, so there's also the body tag. Now I skimmed over the left side. So in this example we're seeing a couple of HTML tags. The first one is the HTML um, tag, so it's called HTML. You just put all of your code in between the HTML opening and closing tags. There's also a head tag. In the head tag, you typically are passing information that's for the browser that does not necessarily appear to the end user. So it does not appear directly in the body of the web page. So that's why we pass the title there. So the title is the title of the web page. It does it does appear to the end user at the top, but it does not um, it does not appear within the body, and that's why it goes in the head tag. The body tag is where you print all your content for the end user. So if we add our body tag and then we just write the word content the end user would see a blank page with the word content. Um, again, this video is recorded. You can find it on drupal.tv. Um, all of the Drupal conference videos are accessible on drupal.tv. Um, I encourage you, if you're looking to get into programming, to go through the exercises, um, play around with these tags. You can write this code. You don't need to install any software. Just open up a simple text editor like Notepad, write this code, and then look at the page in Google Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer, any one of the, the many browsers out there. Right, there are also heading tags. I spoke about heading tags briefly. Um, those are written as H1 for the primary heading, H2 for the secondary, etc. So you can see H1 has the words primary, H2 has the word secondary, and um, we have two of the H2 tags. You can think of it sort of like chapters in a book. H1 would be the title of the book, um, and then the H2s would be the individual chapters. Within a, a chapter, you may have uh, the chapter divided further into sections, and that would be an H3. So again, if you were navigating your book with a screen reader, let's say, um, the screen reader would first read out the H1, which is the name of the book. And the person, or even search engine navigating, could decide, okay, that's a book I'm interested in. I will go deeper to the H2. 
and then that would be chapter one. You might say, let me skip to chapter two, that's the next H2. Interested in that, you go deeper, you read the content, the H3s, you can jump between the H3s. Okay. So again, I'll go back through the exercises later. Um, there are also uh, HTML elements or HTML tags that are used just for organizing content. Um, there are the section and div tags. The div tag is a generic division. So if you just want to separate two things visually, then you would put a div tag around them just so you have a way of separating them. Um, the actual positioning would happen in a different language, CSS, but your ability to just say this is separate from this in some way can be done with a div. A section tag has exactly the same behavior as a div tag, but it has a different meaning. So a section tag um, is used to group content that relates to a single theme. So for example, um, I don't know, Drupal.org has, uh, has like a, three buttons on the home page, and one of them says Drupal for developers, another is Drupal for marketers, another is for like Drupal for decision makers or something like that. Um, if the Drupal.org homepage dove deeper to each of those categories, and maybe it had posts or a lot of information for developers and then information for marketers and decision makers, each of those could be grouped into a section tag. And that would tell search engines, this heading is uh, applies to everything, or everything in this section is relevant to this uh, section heading. Whereas if you had a div, just generic divs, the search engine doesn't know where the developer content starts and finishes. So here's an example. You can put a div um, with ID of sidebar. There's also something called an aside, which might be better for that. But nonetheless, um, you can use a generic division to um, seclude this sidebar word. And then you could add a section around our projects. There are also tags specifically for text. Uh, we mentioned the P tag for paragraphs. So that in a P tag, you just put a full paragraph. By default, Google Chrome and Firefox, they'll do some indentation that they think you want for paragraphs. Um, but again, we don't do these things for styling. We can override the default styling as, you know, as desired. Um, the span tag, um, it doesn't really communicate anything so it doesn't have meaning. It's sort of like the div tag. So the div tag is just used to put an invisible box around something. A span tag is sort of used to put an invisible box around words. So the reason you would do that um, is you'll see it in our design. Sometimes you might have a heading where all of the words look the same except for one. Like there's one word that's um, a different color or maybe lighter font or something. Um, in that case, you might put a span tag around that word just so you have the ability to target it in CSS and say, make that span a different color. And that's really because CSS doesn't have the ability, it doesn't understand words on a page. It only understands elements. So you would use the span for, um, for targeting a word uh, through your CSS or JavaScript. Um, you also have the ability to make lists in HTML. A uh, UL stands for unordered list, which is a bulleted list, and OL stands for a, an ordered list or a numbered list. Whether you use an ordered or unordered list, you would place list items inside of them. So the code on the top shows UL opening and closing with two LIs inside and then OL opening and closing with two list items inside. And you can see how they render on the web page, again, by default. HTML is not used for styling. If we wanted our uh, list to appear without any numbers, we could, we could still use the ordered list tag, and then in CSS we could get rid of the numbers. 
Um, that might sound a little funny, but if you think about this example, if you think about menu links, um, when you're creating a list or choosing your HTML element, you really want to try to not to, to get distracted by your design. So in our uh, example design and in many websites out there, the links appear in a straight row. You know, so it's like home, about us, the links are next to each other. So that doesn't look like a list. That doesn't look like a bulleted list because they're all in the same line and they don't have any um, markers. So, but if you think about it, it, behaviorally, a menu is a list. So <coughs> navigating through your web page with your keyboard or with a screen reader, when you get to your menu, if the links, the links that are sh on our web page are actually give forward, explore, charities, about us. So if you were navigating and you get to the menu um, and you're using a screen reader or Alexa and it's reading the links out loud to you, um, how would you want it to read it? Would you want it to read it as give forward, explore charities about us? Or would you want it to read it as a list? Give forward, explore charities about us. You know, the menu links are a list. You read them in your head as a list. So even though they don't look that way, you would use a list, and then in CSS you would strip out the bullets and you would make them appear next to each other. So I'm going to jump over that slide. Um, in HTML5, more semantic elements were introduced. So HTML has been around a really long time. Um, at some point, HTML5 came out and um, if you've learned HTML before, it's, it's good to know that all of your old HTML is pretty much still valid. HTML5 is the same, but they added ability. They added some additional elements. And a lot of the elements that were added were to provide additional semantic um, information or additional markup. So for example, before HTML5, for the header, we would just create something called a div. We would just create a generic division. And we would, we would create a div, and we might even um, provide an attribute where we say id equals header. Um, but some people would say id equals header. Some people would say id equals head. Someone would say id equals h, id equals top, you know, et cetera. Um, so, um, it's, it's, it was hard or not even possible with 100% accuracy for screen readers and search engines to know what is the header on the page. Um, so all these new tags came out with HTML5. The header tag, it behaves exactly like a div, but you're telling the search engines and such that it's a header. The nav tag behaves exactly like a div, but you're telling them that it's a menu. Um, Etc. We talked about some of the other ones. Um, so with these new tags, they all basically behave like a div, uh, but you're just communicating more information. And that's one thing that Drupal is very good at. Drupal is very good at providing semantically correct HTML, um, and essentially, as long as the people building the site, the Drupal developers building the site, or maybe the content editors who might have access to a WYSIWYG, um, what you see is what you get, uh, text input field. As long as they don't write something that's, you know, use the heading tag for making a word bold, um, Drupal sites, especially Drupal 8, are very um, semantically accurate or you know, they have high quality HTML out of the box. And that's basically it as far as HTML. Um, this, this slide would probably make more sense with the context of the project we're working on. But the idea is, um, if we go through all those exercises, um, you just get a very ugly looking page. You just get like some text, a bulleted list with the menu links, um, and a, a big word for a header, and then some text for the paragraph, and that's it. But that's all that you would do when you're creating the, when you're writing the HTML for this web page. So for this web page, especially if you talk about the header, um, 
you're just going to have a bulleted list. Before you write the CSS, it's going to look like the words continuous good, a bulleted list with, uh, with links. And then this would just be uh, big black letters on a white background. So what's missing? <laughs> HTML looks really bad out of the box, especially for content-heavy websites. And that's where CSS comes in. If I'm moving a little quickly, again, it's just the, the time. Uh, I, when I do this with the exercises, this is actually a three-hour um, three training. <laughs> um, so let's see. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheet. Um, it's used for applying color, alignment, spacing, etc., for making your page look good. Um, I like to think of HTML as the structure for a house, um, maybe the, the furniture, and then with CSS, you do your paint, your finishing, alignment of the furniture. So if you think about a, a new construction which doesn't have paint and, you know, an unfinished basement, an unfinished basement is your HTML. Um, CSS does the carpeting and the paint and the drywall and all that good stuff um, and puts it all together. If you want to take it further, JavaScript is the light switches in the house <laughs> and the light bulbs and PHP is the wiring, um, the electrical wiring and maybe even the plumbing. Okay. So this is sort of what CSS looks like. Um, it consists of a few pieces. The selectors, the, the word selectors over there, um, we'll see some real examples, but basically a selector is your ability to communicate what it is that you want to change the styling of. So if it's a word in the heading, um, you would have a selector to identify that word. Um, the styling properties, those are what styling changes you're actually making. So background color blue, that's a styling property. So here are a couple of examples of selectors. You can target any HTML element. So all the ones we just talked about, div, um, you know, head h1, h2, table, even the body, you can target any of those using CSS by just writing the name of the element. And then sometimes that's not enough because most of the time that's not enough. Uh, you often don't want to change the color of every div on your whole website. Um, so you often need to get more specific. And for that, we can remember we can write attributes in HTML. We can uh, use the ID attribute. So we can write ID equals some word in our HTML. And if we do that, CSS is automatically wired up so that if you put a pound sign or a hashtag and then some word, it'll look through your HTML and look to see uh, do any of these elements have the ID attribute. And so the pound sign maps to the ID attribute. The, in the top right, you can see the period and then the name of class. So a period maps to the class attribute. So in your HTML, you could write class equals something in your CSS, you write period something, and any of the styling properties you apply to that um, class it's called in CSS will apply to the HTML with that class attribute. And you can combine these selectors as well. So, I'm actually running short on time, so I'm going to go even faster. <laughs> um, when you're reading selectors, it combines selectors, like the one you see at the bottom, header, space, nav, pound sign, main, space, li. It's often hard to understand that. I put together a formula for reading these selectors. Um, spaces or sentences are read from right to left. When you hit a space, you can say which is a descendant of, or you could just say the word in. Um, and then words that are not separated by a space but are separated by a period or ID. Um, you would read the period or ID as which has a class of or which has an ID of. So 
applying that formula to this one on the bottom, you read right to left. So you say li, so list item, space, means in. So list item in nav with an ID of main in header. So this, this part's the tricky part, but when you're starting out, I recommend guessing the selector. So you might know that these are the elements I want to target, maybe this is the class. Just guess the order, but then read what you wrote, and you'll, you'll see what's, what doesn't match up. So the list item, maybe the list item is um, not actually inside of the nav, in that case, you might want to switch the order and then read the sentence again until you get to the right selector. That one takes a lot of practice um, to, it's a skill to hone. Um, often two elements will have the same, or one element will have two uh, different selectors applying to it. So you might have a div and you might have a class on that div. In your CSS, you might make all divs in the system red, and you might make everything with that class blue. So which one wins? Um, the one that's more specific. So the most specific selector wins. In your CSS, you look at the selectors. The selector, you, you count the number of IDs, so that's the number of pound signs. You then count the number of classes, the number of periods. And you count the number of elements. And you just put those numbers next to each other. So here, in this example, this is a selector, pound sign unique ID, so that's an ID uh, selector. I count one pound sign there. I don't count any classes because there's no periods, and I don't count any elements because it's not a, that's not an HTML element, that's the ID. So that gets a score of 100, 100. Right beneath that, I'll try to stop moving my mouse for a minute, um, let's count. So how many IDs? Those are pound signs. How many pound signs in the bottom line on this slide? Zero. How many classes? That's how many periods. Um, there are one, two, three classes. How many elements? I see div twice. That's two. So that gets a score of 0, 3, 2, 32. So even though that selector is much longer, 32 is less than 100. So it's a less specific selector, and it loses. So that's the ICE formula. Um, let's see. When writing a CSS class, you want to make sure it's designed for reusability. Like we mentioned, don't name it uh, font. Don't don't name it size 12 pixels. Name it medium, big, small. Um, and re reusability. Another example of that is we have first div on homepage. You would rather name it something that. Um, can apply to more context because if you want to apply that same styling on a different page, first div on home page is no longer a good name. And finally, the selector should not exceed its intended scope. If you want to make a specific block red, don't target every div in the system. Um, so make sure you have an attribute, an ID, or a class that makes it specific enough. Okay. So I think we'll basically be wrapping up here. Um, but the most these are some of the most common CSS properties. Um, there are multiple, you could see the first, really you could say the first five are all used for positioning, and that takes some getting used to. Um, some of them change how elements interact with their neighbors in terms of positioning. Some of them apply spacing inside or outside of the element, um, etc. And there are, of course, um, properties for colors and padding and um, that sort of thing as well. Um, CSS is something you only learn by playing with. You have to write some HTML, CSS uh, to, to get, it's something you have to gain experience with rather than read about. So I highly encourage you to download the project from this slide and if you're interested in a career in programming, reach out. We teach part-time classes. We're based out of DC, but our classes are all offered online as well. Um, I'm the lead teacher, but we've got a, a team of a couple of really great teachers who are focused on 
teaching in a way that actually benefits you rather than checks a box on the, on the to-do list. Um, thank you all. Looks like we don't really have time for questions, but feel free to come up to me and you know ask any questions after the session. Thank you.